Hey all and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about Kepler's Three Laws. Since I don't have a whiteboard with me and I've used up all my wrapping paper, we're going to be doing this presentation style where, you, where you'll get to see everything digitally drawn out and frankly a little bit neater than the other videos. Okay, I'm now in the corner. Let's get started with the first law. You'll hear clicking as I click through the slides. I'm very sorry about that. I can't really edit that out, but hopefully it won't annoy you. So the first law states that objects that are in an orbit uh, will orbit with an ellipse shape with the sun located at one of the foci, which are one of the two yellow dots over here. Um, we can, in the mathematical world, we can sort of grid this out using a vertex and a co-vertex, but that doesn't really make sense in terms of actual space because that's a little bit arbitrary. So instead what we can do is something called the semi-major axis and the semi-minor axis. And this is essentially, um, if you think about an ellipse, you've got a very long side, which is along the vertex in the maths terms, but you've also got the um, vertical side, which should be shorter and more squashed, hence it's an ellipse and not a circle. And so the semi-major axis is essentially half of that distance, which is thus the longest uh, distance from the centre to the actual circumference of the ellipse. And then the semi-minor axis is the shortest distance, but half of that. With an ellipse you can get varying degrees of squishness and so we call that the eccentricity or eccentricity and you can get that using the semi-major and minor axes um, by this formula over here which is e equals the square roots of all of this in brackets 1 minus b squared over a squared so it's a bit like some sort of way of calculating the sort of fraction that the uh, B term is regarding uh, with respect to A, so the semi-major axis. And so things that have a very high eccentricity are going to be squished a lot more. And so the B is going to be much smaller compared to A, and then you're going to get um, a larger value of E. Um, whereas when you've got a perfect circle, B and A should be exactly the same, and so this term is actually going to equal zero, so the eccentricity is also zero. The example ellipse that I've been using has an eccentricity of roughly 0 0.7571. Um, I've calculated this using the rulers that come with the Google Slides, which is pretty fun. Um, but let's actually have a look at some real-life examples of uh, orbits in the solar system and bear in mind that I've tried to draw these as accurate as possible but they do roughly sort of show you the kind of orbits that these things will be in. So we've got Sedna and that has a very high eccentricity of 0 0.854 and that, that's pretty high. We've got a couple of things that are higher than that but those are all in the Kuiper belt with Sedna. Um, we've got Pluto which has a very varying eccentricity um, but on average it's roughly 0 0.24 and that's still quite eccentric compared to the rest of the planets. Mercury is just a slightly smaller eccentricity. And then the most circular thing that we have is actually Triton. It's one of the moons of Saturn, I think. Oh my god! And it's got an almost perfectly circular orbit. Um, the Earth is just slightly more eccentric um, with 0 0.0167, which is still incredibly circular, um, but bear in mind that it's kind of impossible to have something perfectly circular in the real world. Another thing that uh, Kepler might not have known or uh, is sort of an extension to the actual ellipse shape first law is that there are other shapes, although they're not exactly the standard orbit, which is an ellipse. Um, you've also got parabolic orbits, which is where the eccentricity equals one. And then you've got the hyperbolic orbits where the eccentricity is much greater than one. Um, I've tried my best to draw these and they're not exactly perfect, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, but you can also look up the orbit shapes on Wikipedia as well. There's a really good um, diagram made by someone there. One important thing is that uh, the semi-major and minor axes kind of depend on you knowing where the actual centre of these, this ellipse is, which can be a little bit arbitrary for very eccentric orbits. Although for planets like, you know, Mercury, Earth, well, all of them kind of, the Sun is so close to the centre that you can basically just approximate it as a circular orbit and it's perfectly fine. Um, but sometimes that's not always useful because this uh, arbitrary centre isn't really easy to, you know, just measure. So one thing that we can do is instead focus everything on the sun's POV or this big body that everything's 
orbiting. And so we can actually use two different things called the aphelion or the perihelion um, if you're focusing on the sun, or the apoapsis and periapsis if you're just talking about general sort of stars and planets orbiting stuff. Um, but yeah, you, we've also got the aphelion and perihelion for sun specific things. Um, but what we can do actually is, if I plot everything back with the semi-major and minor axis um, onto the diagram as well, we can actually go from one system to the other system. And to do that, it's actually really easy. So to get the semi-major axis, all we need is the arithmetic mean of both of the apses. And for to get the semi-minor axis, we just need the geometric mean. And that's really remarkable, and I didn't actually know this until very recently. Um, but the way that you get these, essentially, is you just use these formulas. So the arithmetic mean is just the sum of the two apses divided by two. And then for the geometric mean, this is a little bit lesser known with people, it's just the square root of the product of the two instead. And I've put them over there for you to see and take notes if you want to. <laughs> so anyway, let's get on to the second law. And so now the second law states that a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out at equal areas per unit time. And that sounds like absolute gibberish, I know, but it's not a very complicated law and it's actually the shortest of all the laws. So if we put the sun there, um, what we can see is if a planet is actually orbiting the sun or just any star, um, when it's at its perihelion, so the closest bit, um, that is when it will be speeding up and going very fast because it's much closer to the sun, it's going to have more gravitational attraction, essentially. And so in order to actually counteract that gravitational attraction, it needs to speed up. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, with the third law when we try and prove it. And so when it's at the aphelion, that's the furthest part, it's going to slow down a lot because it doesn't need to go as fast in order to stay in its orbit. And so for the same amount of time, when you're very close, you're going to be going through a lot more circumference than when you're further away. You're only going to be going through a tiny bit because you're a bit slower. So if we try and draw this out, we've got the closer bit, which sweeps out a larger bit of triangle. So if you um, figure out the area between the two segments, those are the segments that were talked about in the writing of the law. <laughs> um, but then when you move to the much further away bits, you get a very small uh, segment. And so you'd think it's a much smaller area, but in actuality, they are exactly the same area. Um, because it's much further away, you've got an actual longer radius as well. But when it's closer away, you closer to us, you've got a shorter radius. And so even though it sweeps out more, the area is the same. And my diagram is most definitely not to scale and the areas are most definitely not the same, maybe. Um, so don't look at my one and think it's 100% accurate, but um, there are actually more accurate diagrams out there. This is just to actually show you and prove the point. And I guess you can tell I'm not a graphic designer, so I'll get rid of those and you can just see the plain segments on their own. And that's basically the second law, which brings us on to our third and final law, um, which states that the period of the orbit, that's the time it takes to complete the orbit squared, is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. Um, we've written that there with A. And so we can write this mathematically as T squared, that's the period squared, is proportional to, that's the proportion sign, A cubed. And now what we tend to do is because the Earth and the Sun is a fairly circular orbit and so do most of the other planets, um, we tend to just say that the semi-major axis is just the radius you know, of the orbit, and it makes life just a little bit less complex when you've got A's and B's everywhere. And so what I'm gonna very sneakily do right now is switch the A to an R cubed, and then we're gonna continue using that from now on because there's no need to differentiate between the semi-major and minor axes here. We can just say it's the radius, and let's not say anything about it. So let's actually try and prove the third law, and it's actually very simple. It only needs a couple things for you to know. So for a stable orbit, we need the centripetal, or you might know it as the centrifugal force, to equal the gravitational force. And I've written both of these down and equated them over here. So we've got the centripetal force, which is v mv squared over r, and then the gravitational force, which is gmm over r. And so for the centripetal force, this just governs circular motion, you know, how an orbit is, although it's an ellipse, it still applies. 
and we've got little m being the planet's mass if we're talking about uh, a little planet orbiting a big star um, but you could also do little star orbiting big star or star in a galaxy or whatever it doesn't really matter um, but little m here is the little mass, so the planet's mass, and then big M is the big mass, so the star's mass, or the even bigger star's mass, or whatever you want. Um, we've got V being the velocity of the planet as it's orbiting this star, and then R being the radius. G is the gravitational constant, it's very tiny and it stays the same throughout all of the universe, and it's just a constant, It's you don't need to worry about it, it's nothing important. So why is this important? Well, let's have a look at V first. If we have, if we don't have a stable orbit, um, such as if the centripetal force is too high, um, the only way we can really change that is by increasing V, because we've got both radiuses um, on the on both terms <laughs> on both sides, sorry, and then we've got M on both sides. They don't actually really matter too much right now. What's important is V. So if the velocity of this planet is too fast, it's just going to fly out of its orbit. And so we don't need, we can't have the centripetal force be too high. Um, conversely, for the gravitational force, if M is too large, because that's basically what's going to determine the gravitational force here, because once again, we've got one M on both sides, and then we've also got the R terms on both sides. So. Uh, we don't really need to worry about those. If M is too large, so this, this central star's mass is too high, what's going to happen? The planet's going to fall straight into the sun or the star, and it's not going to have an orbit anymore. So what's really important is that both of these are balanced, and then the star, no, not the star, the planet can orbit around nice and perfectly. <laughs> so what we can now do is, well, we've got the formulae over here and equated, uh, we can cancel a couple terms out because they're a bit useless, such as the M and one of the R's. So let's get rid of both of the M's and one of the R's on the um, gravitational side and then the R on the centripetal side and then do some rearranging and we can get V squared equals G M over R. And this is sort of useful um, right now but we still need things in terms of the period, so the time it takes to complete the orbit. So let's add that in over here as well. So I've got the formula above. Um, we know very simply that speed equals distance over time, or velocity in this case, so V equals D over T. And you'll notice that the distance is not the radius here. Um, the, as the planet's moving, it's moving around the circumference instead, so you can't use the radius in this case. But we know that the circumference is 2 pi times the radius because it's just basic circle maths and that the time is the period of the orbit. So we can sub in the, the, the velocity is 2 pi r divided by t. Um, that's subbing that into the speed equals distance over time equation and then we can sub that back into the actual v squared equation. So if we do that we've got 2 pi r over t squared. You can immediately see that once we open these brackets out We've got an r squared on one side and a t squared, that's what one thing that we need. And then we've got a reciprocal, or is it reciprocal? A 1 over r term. So you can immediately see that we've already got what we need, we just need to rearrange things. And so what we do is we open out the brackets, and then what we'll also do then is shift around the um, g m onto one side, shift the t onto the other side, and then we get t squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed over gm, and you can immediately see already that we've got exactly what we need. So that's the third law proven. Maybe in the next video, maybe the video after, I'm going to be going through binary systems. So that's when the masses of both the planet, well, not really the planet, the star and the other star are roughly similar. Or in the case of maybe like Pluto and Charon, you've got the planet being very similar to the moon, if you could even call it a moon. That's basically all of Kepler's three laws. I really hope you enjoyed it and awesome work if you were able to catch up with me. And here's a gold star for surviving all of that. I hope you enjoyed that. I will see you very soon. Bye.